Hello everybody, it's Fight Club Hubs here, and I am joined by Jan and Mr. Mark B. Writing. And, yeah, it's Thursday, we know, uh, we were rescheduled, Tuesday was my wife's birthday, and yeah, nothing was going to happen that day. So, uh, we got a really interesting show today, Jan's got us a wonderful rant about game accessibility that she's going to bestow upon us. We're going to talk a little bit about the behind-the-scenes torment that was going on at Anthem, uh, in regards to Anthem. Uh, let's just say it's EA up to their old bullshit again. And then, um, gonna have ourselves a fun little topic. Uh, I know nothing about this, but Mark has been researching this like crazy. We're gonna be talking about DLive, a new streaming platform. Um, that recently made the headlines because, you know, some douchebag said that they're going there. Uh, <laughs> So uh we can we can say his name. He's he's not like fucking Voldemort. That's not like Beetlejuice, for <laughs> thank God. I don't I don't I don't want to give him any more attention. The last thing I need is some followers of his just jumping in here saying, Hey, support him. Follow him. Can I tell you I had somebody yeah, fucking come into my chat once and tell me like they, they donated like a bit and they were like support PewDiePie and I was like, click ban. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope your finger's hovering over the ban button then, Mark. Uh, it's oh, a shame it was only a bit. You couldn't else. have given it back to him. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, I don't know. Have we been playing here. anything lately, guys? I'm just curious. The camera's all. The camera's um, all gone. What probably. the heck? What did you do to the camera, Jan? I didn't do I nothing. Didn't what you did to the camera. I didn't do shit. Mm -hmm. Like mobile phone games, maybe, but not really anything substantial i don't think um more super robot wars v no games have come out recently and i'm i'm uh under some financial difficulties until friday where like my my life will be dramatically changed going forward so um yeah it's just personal stuff it's not a big deal but no worries um but yeah i haven't really bought anything i haven't really played anything i don't think i've just um, no. Nah. How about you, Jan? Um, fighting games, mostly. Tournament this weekend here at in home, so that'll be fun. Really nothing much else. That and my standard MMOs. Yeah. What uh, game were you uh, practicing for? Uh, Tekken and Unis. <clears throat> Which Tekken? Seven? Seven, yeah. Well, you know how the Tekken community works. When a new game comes out, they all go to that one. They don't hang around the last generation. Because it's usually the best one. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> but, uh... Hey, Carl. It's not uh, like I, Dead or Alive or anything. My, my oh, friend gosh. Carl, oh, I, I, feel like, I feel like he will have some interesting points to contribute on the accessibility conversation. Okay. Um. So, real quick, I guess what I've been playing is... Uh, I was going to try and play some DOA 6 lobby. Uh, the lobby update went live today. Oh, finally. Yeah. Uh, nobody joined my room, and I couldn't find any lobbies. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought then, you were, I thought you were like, incredibly mad at that game and didn't want to play it anymore. I don't know why I like to punish myself, Mark. You know this. Yeah, most of the people that are playing DOA are playing on PS4, not PC. That's probably why. Well, a lot of the people that I hang around with have it on PC, so they just weren't available at the time. But yeah, PS4 is the main platform of choice. Um, I've been playing a little bit of Monster Hunter Ultimate still, uh, Generations Ultimate. Uh, I got psyched because they announced a, a new Monster Hunter game is coming out for the Switch. Uh, there was a leak about it, apparently, up in France or something. Uh, did uh, You saw the link I posted uh, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago? That looks uh, very exciting. Uh, it'll be interesting. It I'm, does. I'm kind of... I'm interested enough to maybe say that it'll be something that I'll probably play between that and when Iceborne, Iceborne comes out. Yeah. Well, it's probably not going to come out until maybe next year, so we'll all have had our... <laughs> our... our uh, uh, fun with uh, Iceborne for at least a few months, several months before then. Man, so, we'll see. Yeah. Um, 
I also want to say that we actually debuted GV and Live Play last Wednesday, uh, last Tuesday. Yay! Uh, me and Mark, uh, we, we played a silly little game called Viscera uh, Cleanup Detail. Um, yeah, I played that game back when it first came out <laughs> and had like no real overall mechanical structure or design and it's good to see that like two three years after the fact it still has no real (laughs) they're like clean up but they don't really entail like what that means so you know i like fucking i i got tired of like throwing everything away so i found like this like like this plasma torch torched everything (laughs) and then we just like cleaned up all the dirt and the blood that was left and they're like yeah you got like a negative score for that i'm like okay yeah we we completed the job and said you're fired what did you want (laughs) apparently when mark decided to use the laser uh the laser uh he he didn't just fry up like all the giblets and all that stuff he blackened Mm -hmm. the entire room and then we hit the i uh, washed it afterward (laughs) yeah leaving the scorch marks all over the place (laughs) No, the scorch marks washed away. It was fine. <laughs> and then we hit job completed. Uh, I am perfectly satisfied with my job. They give us an option of rating ourselves, and then we are immediately prompted like, with, you uh, you you're fired. This? And my, my response was, I'm done, and the union's got my back on it. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, and then I got like a score so bad that they're like, yeah, the company went out of business, and, and then assassins are trying to kill you. And I was like, mm, okay, okay, maybe you <laughs> should, maybe you should give me a little bit more feedback on what you mean by clean. <laughs> I have to say, I just find it cute in that first room that we were in, where we were cleaning, where we're we're, we're we're still somehow finding things to clean, and then you climb up the little escalator elevator. And you get to a window that's at least two stories high, and you're finding body parts and stuff up there. Yeah, there's this dude that just exploded up there. <laughs> there's just blood and gore and everything else. And that was where I found, like, the, the, the laser incinerator gun, and I was like, all right. <laughs> you had a little too much fun with that. Listen, it cleaned, okay? <laughs> it's sanitized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, we don't have to throw away the body Uh-oh. parts anymore. We just burned them. <laughs> Corduroy's the wounds. <laughs> no. Corduroy is a type of fabric that you wear. Where? The term that you're looking for is cauterize. Oh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. <laughs> well, you should be. Cauterized. <laughs> Words mean things. Good. <laughs> Uh, fine. Just like uh, the way you re- it misinsinuated what I meant by fuck that lolly when I was talking about the new character they unveiled for uh, listen, DOA Venus. Listen, no. she's 1,014 years old. It's not lolly, it's Petenko. Get it right. I don't give a shit. She looks like a 14-year-old little girl. Fuck First that Ani. Misinterpreted is the word you're looking for. Misinsinuated is not a word. Second, don't fuck the lolly. That's gross. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good black cherry uh, soda. So, um, we're, uh, we're, our, our engines are all revved up. Uh, Jan, I give you the floor. So, over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of memory and ridiculousness surrounding a specific game. Um, I'm sure a lot of you probably already know what it is. Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice from From Software. Um, the problem ended up being that when a lot of people, and by a lot of people I mean like the journalists and a larger percentage of the community in general, just gamers in general, got their hands on this game, they were watching people who were playing it who were relatively good at these kinds of games, who play these kind of games consistently. Um, when you have people that I know of, um, for instance, Avenko, um, otherwise known as Gaijin Hunter, he's a really well-known um, Monster Hunter player. Mm-hmm. Um, him and Eric's and a couple of the other big, big-time like Monster Hunter guys in the community were saying that the game was bullshit. And it's not so much that they were saying it was bullshit because it wasn't something they couldn't do, but because they felt like some of the mechanics felt awkward to them. And so they started kind of getting a little bit deeper into the game. Now, all of them have beaten the game at least once, if not more. 
And a lot of them have said, like, the game is fantastic. It's just that the mechanics have some nuances or some subtle things that maybe are a little bit more... Um, what's the word I'm looking for that everyone's been using? Right, difficult. That's the nature of From Software games. If you go back and you look at the rest of the Soulsborne world that they've made, these games can I, were... Can I interject for one second? Because this is a pet peeve of mine that pisses me the fuck off a lot, and it's not your fault, but everybody fucking does it, and I fucking hate it. Modern From Software games. From Software has been around since, like, the introduction of the PlayStation 1, mm -hmm. and many of the games that they have made were not this ball-bustingly difficult. Oh, again, this is this is not you. Like, you're... I'm not angry at you. It's just... Oh, no, I understand. It pisses me off so fucking much that a <laughs> lot of people are just like, From Software didn't exist until Demon Souls came out. Oh, no, I understand that. That's mm -hmm. not what I'm getting at. But... I've been playing fucking Armored Core since the very first one mm -hmm. came out. Yes. It was the very first fucking game that came out from From Software in the u.s i mm -hmm. thought they did not all of their games are like this most of their games in aggregate are not like this i thought kingsfield came after the first armored core uh in the u.s no the first kingsfield did in point of fact come before armored core but we did not get the first kingsfield we got the second kingsfield which mm -hmm. was named kingsfield uh, for some reason. okay i don't fucking that just the 90s 90s so so the baseline I'm getting at, though, is that most From Software games have a level of difficulty built into them, regardless of what game you're playing, be it Armored Core or the Soulsborne world. That is inherent in From Software games that are U.S. side games, that are generally perceived as part of why From Software is the game maker that it is, because those games have an inherent difficulty to them, be it the mech combat because of its... Well, let's be honest, the first couple of Armored Cores were very clunky games, but the they were better The first couple? <laughs> uh, I mean, can we, can we, just, just for a second, just for a second, do you know when From Software started using the right analog stick in Armored Core games? It was four, wasn't it? No, <laughs> next Oh, okay. That was, and I'm not even fucking kidding here. The, I'm not even kidding. That was the fifth goddamn Armored Core to come out on the PlayStation 2. You know, the console that debuted with a second analog stick. stick? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I think that the, it took the... them. It took them five fucking games to say, hey, there's this other stick on the controller. Maybe we should do something with that. <laughs> you motherfuckers. <laughs> Continue, Jan. He's just so, going to keep going if you don't stop. No, it's if fine. Stop. No, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm happy with the derail. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with everything you're saying. I, I, I understand that there is inherent design flaws in a lot of what they've done. Um, in fact, a lot of the problems and a lot of the reasons why the first Dark Souls was perceived as bad was because it was just poor design philosophy. And yeah, I remember, I remember Alex, uh, the guy, uh, Alex the card that I worked mm -hmm. for, slash with, slash whatever, at a uh, Hard Game Fan, made the specific observation that it was it was basically possible to just run out of resources and like have a broken weapon and no way to repair it, and you're just fucked. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that and camera angles and all sorts of other things created an inherent difficulty... We're in an era now where the games themselves have become better because of the fact of their difficulty. They were built into that difficulty. They basically took that and said, we embrace this as part of our design philosophy, and that's why they continued to make the games the way they did. The problem stems from the fact that that's not accessible. A lot of times you look at where gaming has come from and where gaming is going, and there's this weird sort of centerpiece that kind of appeared just, I don't know, maybe a decade, decade and a half ago? Late 90s, early 2000s. Where everything started to sort of open up. It wasn't niche, it wasn't niche anymore. It wasn't like anime. It wasn't like 
you know, eating with chopsticks. It was it wasn't weird anymore. It was accessible. It was commonplace. Everybody used these things. They they did these things. It was it was normal all of a sudden. And now all of a sudden you have this much larger demographic demographic of people who are basically saying, "Hey, I want to do that too." I want to be able to play that game, or I want to be able to do that thing, or I want to be able to go to that place. And it became a lot more intrinsic in how things were built from the ground up. You would take things from other places that worked, and you would add on to that from your own standpoint. And a lot of what happened with, not just from software, but a lot of that specific genre, that the the, the sort of action-y... RPG genre that's built like this. So you've got things like, obviously, the Soulsborne universe, Blood <clears throat> Soul, Soul, Bloodborne. Um, but then you also kind of look at some of how action platforming, just in general, also sort of progressed. Things like Spyro and Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. These are also very relatively unforgiving games if you were not capable of being able to platform the way the game wants you to. Sort of the same way that Sekiro won't allow you to continue a boss fight if you don't have the ability to fight that boss the way it's intended to be fought. Does that necessarily mean that there are ways around it? Absolutely there are. I've seen videos of people that have beat bosses in a minute because they were able to just Counter blow, counter blow, counter blow, you know, and insta kill, and they'd get <clears> both <throat> their insta kills within a minute, minute and a half. I mean, there's a noted un unbugged speed run of the game that's sub one hour. So it's not impossible. It's not. It takes a specific kind of person to be able to do that kind of play, but it's not impossible. This is where the argument comes though is that there are certain people in gaming in general who have this concept of an idea that basically is, hey, look, if I only have an hour and I want to spend it trying to do as much as I can instead of being stuck on one boss fight, then maybe I should be able to play it on an easier difficulty so that I can. Cool. I don't have a problem with that argument. I don't. But saying it, it it has to have an easy mode, that's where I get a little kind of, eh, not really. That's kind of the reason why these games exist. If you're in a position where you have to play this game for your job, and you're able to objectively say, <clears throat> it's not for me, but it's probably for these people, or it's built for this kind of demographic then that's fine. That, to me, makes sense. But when you really look at sort of the argument behind a lot of it, these guys are basically saying it should always be like this. And I don't agree with that. However, the problem also stems from the fact that there are two sides to this argument. And I'm not entirely sure where or how this started, because it's kind of convoluted to me where it actually started. I, I don't know if it was somebody on Twitter or if it was somebody on Facebook that started the whole argument. Um, but the baseline is that somebody made a parallel to easy mode also being for disabled people. Nah, I don't really think that's true either. Because I know there are people who play at a professional level in various types of games and by professional, I mean speedrunners and fighting game community players who are very disabled. They have malformations or they have missing limbs or there's a, a, a cognitive disability, okay? I've seen eight-year-olds take top eight at majors for a fighting game. So, no, it's not a matter of whether or not the game is difficult and is not accessible to specific types of demographics. It's a matter of there are certain types of people who think that it should be, and I don't think that that's right. My biggest issue stems from the fact that, and, and I'm going to make another parallel to the FTC. 
most of the people who are in the FGC know the name Brawly Legs. Hobbs, you know that. Yep. Yeah. He's a Street Fighter player. He's also got malformations and issues and plays with his tongue and can place top eight consistently. <laughs> <laughs> okay? He's good. He's really good. And I think a lot of it stems from the fact that that sort of accessibility, even in a game that can generally be played by people who have two hands, by a person with a thumb and a tongue. So I don't really see the validity in that argument because anything can be accessible to anybody who's willing to put in the time, the effort, and the <coughs> to do it. Period. And I think that's where a lot of this is coming from. People think that just because the game is hard for them, it's hard for everybody. But it's been proven multiple times that it's not. And I feel like that's really where a lot of problems are coming from, especially with Sekiro, and basically saying, hey, this game needs to have an easy mode. Not, it, it, it would benefit, not, it might be useful. It's, it needs to have. And I don't feel like that's, A, doing the game justice, and B, right. Because you don't have the authority to say that. You don't. Because there are plenty of other people in just a gamer spectrum that are probably ten times worse off than you are and have probably beaten the game. <laughs> so it's hard to say one way or the other whether or not something like this really feels like it's just somebody starting discourse because they want clicks or if this is actually somebody who actually understands the ideal of, hey, look, gaming may not be for everybody, but there are certainly ways of making it accessible. From games that have been around for decades that are just now starting to understand accessibility functionalities for colorblind people to uh, X, you know, Microsoft making a controller that is very very specifically meant for people with disabilities so that they can play whatever they want to play. And you can plug in any type of controller or any type of button or any type of manipulation device that you want that can be easily modified on a block into this device so that they can plug it into their Xbox or to their PC to play video games. In fact, that's something Microsoft uh, unveiled last year, correct? The uh, mm -hmm. game controllers that are made for people who are physically disabled. No, it's not just physically disabled. There are people who are mentally disabled who have the ability to play the games through this controller because yeah. of the types of manipulations that they have. They have other devices that can be <clears throat> electrically you know, crafted into this controller to allow them to play. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff that creates accessibility. It's, you know, I don't want to draw the parallel, but I'm going to go out on a limb and basically say <coughs> this is basically the wheelchair ramp argument all over again. That's that's basically at its at its core. That's what this sounds like to me. Now, if I'm off base, please let me know because I'm I'm probably just shooting from the hip on that. But I really feel like that's correct. I feel like this is basically the wheelchair ramp, you know, rant from from people from like the late eighties, early nineties again. Because mm -hmm. they're basically saying, hey, this has to be something that anyone could get into if they're in a wheelchair or if they can walk. Okay, so you've got ramp on one side, stairs on the other. Sure, maybe there's some growing pains, and sure, maybe there's some extra cost that goes into something like this. But in the long run, this kind of stuff has been around for a while, and we're just now starting to hear about it because certain people in certain positions are basically going up oh, i'm bad i need to be somebody who doesn't have to worry about it and i'm not saying that disabled players shouldn't have game access the thing is is that certain types yeah, so of I'm gonna, games... I'm gonna interrupt right here actually because I'm, I'm i've had to have myself muted for the past couple of minutes because you are making me really fucking angry uh -huh. I'm sorry, Jen. I love you. You're a wonderful person. <laughs> but I want you to go into the chat right now. Blade21. Mm -hmm. He has um, schizencephaly. You could probably liken it to something akin to cerebral palsy. Okay. The first year that I knew him, we were hanging out at one point, and he said, I need you to come over to my apartment and do me a favor. I said, why? He said, I'm at the last boss of Uncharted 2, and I can't beat it. I came over, I beat it on the first try. He had been on that for literal days. 
Now, if you don't if you don't know what this disorder is, let me let me help you with that. It is a rare congenital cerebral malformation characterized by the presence of linear clefts in one or both hemispheres of the brain, extending from the lateral ventricles to the pile surface of the cortex, and that lead to a variety of neurological symptoms such as epilepsy, motor deficits, and psychomotor retardation. Um, what this means for him is that like his left arm and his left leg he basically act like he's had a stroke. Mm -hmm. He can walk, but if you if you talk to anybody that knows him that is this personally friends with us, he walks very difficult. <clears throat> like it, it's it's mm -hmm. it's visually obvious that there's something up. Um, when he, he moves his left hand, like he asks me to shuffle cards for him when we sure. play board games together because he can't do it. Sure. And you know, it, it, it sucks for him. Like, this is a conversation he and I, like, what you're talking about is a conversation he and I have been having for literal years. Now, mm -hmm. you may have seen me on Twitter advancing this point, or you may have seen Dr. Ian Hamilton, who is an accessibility specialist helping studios avoid excluding gamers with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Or you may have seen Cherry Ray, who wrote an article for IGN uh, talking about accessibility in gaming. What you would not have seen is any of them saying that this is mandatory, because that's not happening. Nobody's saying that accessibility needs to be mandatory in games. And if they are, they're an asshole. Most people are making the observation that accessibility is a conversation that we need to have, and Sekiro mm -hmm. is a really good time for us to be having this conversation because it's an extremely difficult game that a very small percentage of the gaming market can get into. Um, also, while we're on the subject, uh, regarding the Brawly Legs comparison, I really fucking hate that comparison, and it's not anything to do with him or anything to do with you, because I understand it's not where you're going with this, but mm -hmm. it's great for Brawly Legs that he is capable of doing this. He is an inspiration, okay? More people should be celebrating what he has done, because he is somebody who has overcome his disability in an amazing way. Absolutely. But, but... Just because Elaine Robert climbed the New York Times building doesn't mean that we don't need elevators. There are a lot of people who simply cannot get past their disability or don't have the money to do it. Because let's be clear, a lot of the, the stuff that Brawley Legs is working with requires additional apparatuses. Absolutely. Maybe people don't have the kind of insurance where they can afford to get that. Or maybe people just don't have the time to commit. Because, again, you know, CJ works a full 40-hour-a-week gig. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he comes home, and he, he deals with the stuff in his relationship. He takes care of his dog. He records a podcast. It, it's not necessarily in him to put in the amount of effort that would be required to get good at one game or two games or three games. But for somebody like him, a lot of gaming is just completely passed aside. Like, he has way less access to gaming than a lot of us do. Like, for mm -hmm. us, we have to have the conversation of, is this a genre that I want to play? Is this on a console that I want to play? Do I want to devote my time to this? For him, mm -hmm. he always has to have the conversation to himself of, can I mechanically play this game? And that's always going to be a thing he's going to have to be worried about that most people aren't. Now, me personally... I don't think From Software or anybody should have to, have to, add anything in if they don't want to. And a lot of the people that I've mentioned here <clears> agree. <throat> it, it should be up to the decision of the developer as to whether or not they want to include things. That's absolutely not a conversation that respectable people are having here. Um, there may be a few outlier people on Twitter and other platforms who are demanding this sort of thing. They are in the minority and they are the assholes. Mm -hmm. The people who actually ha are talking about it normally are using Sekiro as a jumping off point to have conversations about accessibility as a concept because it's very, very important that we start talking about this now. Because mm -hmm. now you mentioned colorblindness. Uh, my friend God of Zig, Kane, is colorblind. Yes. And yeah. for him, the fact that people have been starting to add in colorblindness mechanics is fucking amazing. Like, he's just had to deal with the fact for... for decades at this point that he just didn't know when stuff was going to happen certain games that use color as a specific mechanic were just unplayable for him sure. and like now he's at a point where it's like holy shit like stuff is actually catering to me and like this is the thing this is this is the thing i definitely agree that some developers should not 
change their vision. Like, mm -hmm. Sekiro does not have to be a game that is for everybody. There can absolutely be games that are not for everyone. But this is the conversation that we absolutely need to have. Absolutely. Like, one of my friends said that he thought that the conversation around this felt like it was pandering. And, like, for me, it's... I understand that, you know, he didn't mean what he said in that way. And I understand that y you didn't mean what you said in that <clears throat> way. But that hurts my feelings because I am very passionate about the idea of gaming being open to everybody. Because mm -hmm. I have friends who can't play the games that I play. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's... I hate that I can't talk to some of my friends and be like, this is a great game, you should play it, without having to stop and think, fuck, can this person even play this game? I don't have that problem with you. I don't have that problem with Robert. I don't have that problem with most of the other people I talk with on social media or Discord. I don't have to worry about that. But, for me, it's, I would like it if more games were accessible. And the problem that we are having here isn't that we can't, isn't that like those people are having that conversation. It's that I'm watching these people who are making the very reasonable suggestion of this is a conversation that we need to have. Like these are things that need to be considered. And I'm watching them get pilloried into fucking leaving social media for days at a time because of the shitheads who are like, you're demanding this. So I just, I just want this to be clear. N nobody is demanding this. I understand right, right. that that's an argument a lot of people have made. I saw that on the True Talk podcast last week, and mm -hmm. it wasn't true then. Nobody's demanding this. If they are, they are an extremely, extremely small minority. So small that I have never seen them on social media. And I've been looking for for weeks now, since oh, Sekiro true. came out. Absolutely. They, they don't exist. Or if they do exist, they're so small I couldn't find them. Mm-hmm. It is completely reasonable to have a conversation about accessibility, and we should. Absolutely. Nobody nobody should be demanding that Sekiro should have accessibility options. It's right. from software's game. They can do whatever the fuck they want. But that is a really good jumping off point for discussing how accessibility works. As Ian Hamilton made the observation, for accessibility purposes, we don't want... He didn't want to make Sekiro easier. What he wanted to do was try and figure out, as a thought experiment, a way in which you could replicate the experience of Sekiro mechanically so that somebody who has disabilities that make playing it in its default form impossible, that would still make that game as difficult for the disabled person as it would for a regular person. Um, so that, like, they could replicate the experience that, like, that everybody else is having. He doesn't mm -hmm. want to make the game easier. He wants to make it so that there is an experience available for people who are just quite literally incapable of playing. And again, this isn't like... From Software doesn't have to implement this. This is literally just a thought experiment. But, <coughs> you know, it's... These kind of conversations are conversations that we need to be having. Mm -hmm. Because gaming as an art form is completely different from any other art form that exists out there in that you mechanically have to interact with it mm -hmm. a blind person can still watch a movie they just need to have like various descriptive subtitles turned on uh, a deaf person can still watch a movie they just need closed captioning you know it's it's you know a, a blind person can still read a book they just need braille video games are unique in that they make it so that there are addition, there's an additional barrier of entry to being able to even access the art in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if we want to treat video games as art, and I do, we need to be able to sit down and have a conversation about what that means. Like, I'm not great at debating. I'm not somebody who is studied on this sort of stuff. I am probably not the person to be having that discussion with, but I think it's reasonable to want to have that discussion, and I think we should while we're at the point where gaming is still growing, instead of it when it's at a point where it's you know so far gone that we're 
desperately trying to play catch up. Mm, does that feel like a good uh, <laughs> point to leave off on this conversation, or is there any more thoughts that you uh, wish to share, Jan? Well, I mean, a lot of what he says is very true, it, and, and I, I agree, agree with, with it. I agree with it too. <clears throat> yeah, that's you know to to say that I am not a person who wants people that are disabled or don't have the accessibility to have accessibility would be a lie because I do want people to have accessibility. My point on all of this, though, is, is that we have technology that's being created, but it's not accessible technology. And I feel like the issue really stems from people not understanding disabilities. And so what I'm trying to get at here is, is that accessibility in games from a disability standpoint is not the same as a person who is like you or me or Mark who can play these games normally and can have the ability to beat these kinds of games without any problems at all, saying that it needs to also have a mode specifically for people like them, like journalists who may not have a lot of time and want just to be able to go through the story. No, and I have different opinions from you on that subject as well, but I'm not particularly passionate about those, so I don't care to get into it. Fair. But the baseline is, is that that's, that's my whole standpoint on this. To say that somebody who has the ability to do these kinds of games without any problems, saying that they want accessibility versus the outcry from actual, you know, the, the, the actual disabled community who are saying accessibility is necessary... They're not the same. They'll never be the same. Uh, they're, see, they're not the same. Like, they're, they're not the same, but but allyship is important too. I mean, absolutely. Like, if they're making that argument specifically because they want it to be easier, then yeah, that's that's bullshit. But and that's the whole thing know, is, is that a lot of this stems from that exact argument, where specific people in journalistic places are basically going. Hey, look! I cheat. That's that's where the cheat meme came from. Yeah, but he wondering. didn't he didn't make that argument as an accessibility thing. He just made that argument because he was saying like I cheated using this particular thing, and I'm fine. I'm happy. It, it yeah. didn't really affect me. Like he didn't he didn't use that as a platform to talk about accessibility or to defend accessibility or anything. He was using that article as a way of saying. I got tired of bashing my face against this particular boss. I put in a cheat, and I'm fine. Sure. And like, you know, we can, you know, we can disagree on what that article means and the feelings of that. But like, that wasn't an argument about accessibility coming from him. Um, people using that as a jumping-off point for a thought experiment on <clears throat> accessibility is fine, because that particular mod actually could be useful for somebody who has, mm -hmm. you know, like who has bad reaction time as a result of disability. Again, like it's not something that needs to be mandatorily implemented. But I mean, like if, if a journalist in general is talking about that sort of thing, if they are transparently doing it as a way of defending that they want an easy mode, then yeah, fuck them. Like that's, you know, be an ally exactly. or don't, but don't use allyship as an example of that. But exactly. I can't, like I haven't seen any articles like that. Most of the articles that I've seen have either been people owning that they want an easy mode, uh, like Dave Thier over at uh, Forbes, <coughs> or um, uh, the, the dude over at Kotaku, etc. Or it's been people talking about the accessibility conversation as, like, accessibility allies. And for me, like, right. something that was drilled into me a long time ago was I wanted to write an article for a diehard game fan about, like, the, the, the presentation of the Tomb Raider reboot and mm -hmm. the problems that I had with it um, from, from a feminist perspective. And, like, I kind of felt, like, you know, what the fuck do I have to say about that from a feminist perspective? And my friend Crystal was like, it, it doesn't just matter if, if you're, like, what gender you are here. We need allies. We need people who are saying, this, this doesn't directly affect me, but it's still fucking important, and we need to talk about it. Right. And for me, like, that's something that's always stuck with me. Like, why I'm, I'm very much the sort of person who is like, you know... I don't appreciate it 
Like, I, I will stand up and say, like, you know, I don't appreciate this thing that is disrespectful to women. I don't appreciate this thing that is dis disrespectful to people in the LGBT community. And I don't appreciate this thing that's, you know, disrespectful to, like, uh, folks who are disabled. It's, I'm not any of those things. I'm the fucking default. Like, I'm creator, I'm creator wrestler at number six in WWE <laughs> SmackDown versus Raw. You know, I'm the default. But <clears throat> it, it's still important for for somebody like me to just be able to say like you know this is like this is something we need to think about mm -hmm. just because you know if we don't then who sure mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh. i do agree with you that yeah if if i had seen a journalist who was using that very transparently as a way of saying they wanted an easy mode i would have told them to go fuck themselves as well because you're mm -hmm. not an ally you're just an asshole exactly Okay, so, um, how about we move on from this, uh, wonderful topic? <laughs> I think everything that we could say has possibly been said at this point. That was like 45 minutes, Jesus Christ. Yeah, <laughs> almost Look, 45 minutes. This is, this is something that's been in the news that's important and it needs to be, it's like absolutely. you said before, and like mm -hmm. I said, and like Mark, you know, like we've all said it. This is important and it needs to be talked about. It needs to be discussed. There mm -hmm. are viewpoints and there are places and it makes sense because this is the kind of stuff that we're building into. This is the kind of community that we're trying to foster. And this is the kind of gaming that we all want to enjoy. It's just how do we make it happen? And that's important yeah. to talk about. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of points of frustration I have with the accessibility discussion just sure. in general. Like, one of the one of the things that really frustrates me the most, Ooh. and this is where I think I want to end it, is there are actually a lot of games at this point that are becoming more and more accessible to gamers as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, visual novels. Uh, oh, walking simulators, as you would call them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. like stuff that requires the minimal amount of interaction but still allows you to play games in that capacity. And it really uh, frustrates me when, like, people will also be like, you know, those aren't games, those aren't art, etc. Well, there's also, <laughs> like, the standard fare of action games that are coming out. They have a casual mode, which allows people to still enjoy the game with a certain degree of difficulty to it, but pretty much makes it more something for them to enjoy, which may also be an option for, you know, our handicapped friends. Y'all forgetting about the first one that did it, Mass Effect. Yeah. And you know what, again, like, I, I feel like <laughs> that's I feel like that's not a bad option. You know, not really. Uh, you difficulty is not always the beginning and the end for disabled gamers, mind you. Some gamers are like it's not a challenge issue, but it's it's certain other aspects, which is why you know accessibility experts look at it from every possible example, uh, from every possible direction. And a lot of games are actually getting really good into that. Uh, Division Two offers a lot of accessibility mm. options that. I would never even have considered not just like colorblindness and uh, as uh, CJ mentions button mapping is a huge button issue. Mapping if you can't so, remap buttons in a game and um, I, uh, mm -hmm. well, I, well I there are some that. things like right here here's my Xbox controller pro it has right here these little dongles right here you can attach and button map which okay. may be access, which may be a great option for uh, your friend there. I don't know if that so, works. So no, the uh, the, the way that the Xbox controller is laid out, he physically can't use it. We've had that discussion. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, it's it's not a matter of what's on the controller it's fits in his hands. He he has Plus dainty hands as well. Mm. Oh, sure, that makes sense. So he I, a, I am he is a very I'm thin man with dainty, dainty hands. i whatever. <laughs> it's fine. You do you. Um, the button mapping thing for me is no. He has a fiance now. He doesn't have to. Hilarious. Hilarious. Now, the button mapping thing for me is an issue, too. It's a big reason why I actually couldn't play, um, uh, couldn't play Bloodborne. Mm. Because I am a Monster Hunter player. I am mm. muscle memory ingrained in the Monster Hunter button setup. This is my role. Not this. I died all the time. I can't really play. I can't really play Bloodborne all that effectively because I can't roll the way I'm used to rolling, because I can't button map where the roll goes. Now you can in Sekiro. Thank God. Cause That's I interesting did. to me because I didn't have that problem playing <laughs> Same here. Bloodborne. Like so, I, I literally, I never would have thought of that as a thing. But yeah. To me, that wasn't an issue because I could button map in Sekiro because I'm so ingrained in Monster Hunter because I've been playing that style of, of action game like that for so long 
that changing it to be anything else, just I couldn't do it. I tried to play Sekiro with default controls. I did, and it's I'm just not it. I can't. I physically can't do it. I don't have the the hand eye coordination to remember or the muscle memory to remember this is the type of button I need to hit. So I remapped it to where it was with Monster Hunter, and I've been one shotting everything. So for me, it's not as it's it's a completely different setup. But it's also because of my own personal cognitive issues. Having the ability to button map is probably one of the first accessibility things that just about any type of action game needs to have. It has to have that. Not having button mapping makes certain types of games completely unplayable for me, so I don't get to play those games. And I just watch other people stream it, which makes me sad because I really want to experience it. But I physically can't because I don't have the ability to button map. If I had button mapping in other types of games, probably wouldn't be an issue for me. Yeah, and like I think that's a really important point too, because accessibility doesn't just mean like you know difficulty or whatever. It's it's literally stuff we don't even think about. That stuff we take advantage. We, really we important. just a lot of people yeah. take for granted. Absolutely, take for granted. Yeah. Yes. Oh well, yeah. Okay. Let's... So talking about people taking things for granted. Let's yes. talk about EA, EA. And Bioware with Anthem. Thank you for. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you can literally just replay all of my comments about Mass Effect. Uh, Andromeda over this conversation because it's Absolutely. literally the exact same goddamn debacle. Mm -hmm. So the fun stuff happened again with EA, only this time it was all over Anthem. Mark, what was your initial impressions about Anthem when you tried it? So I played the beta weekend. What did you think of the beta? I thought it was great. Uh, the The gunplay was a lot of fun. The, <clears throat> the, the flight experience was a lot of fun. In the 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 what they showed you in that playable like three four hours was awesome, and I was oh. like, this game is great. I want to play this. I I'm sold. I didn't think they could pull it off, but it looks like they did. It's it's the best. It, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Okay, what were your thoughts two months later? It's shit. <laughs> I'm glad that I just got the origin pass and didn't actually pay money for the fucking game. I am. Deeply, deeply apologetic to my friend Sean, who went out and bought that game on my recommendation. And between that and the Division Two, I basically learned I I will never trust anybody's opinion on the game ever again. <laughs> because no. every time people tell me that a game is good, it's not. If I'm if I'm not already sold on it, if I'm not already convinced. And people tell me that I should be. I shouldn't listen to them. I should just listen. I to can't my even God. recommend a game to you, period, because I know what type of games you are you're into, and half the time we're not even agreeing on the same game. I mean, I, I was never going to play DOA Six, Robert. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even like DOA Six. What? Well, why would I? I never recommended it. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just saying in general. Yeah. Um. So. Our buddies over at Bioware are having a bit of a hard time. Apparently, uh, in an interview with, uh, I forget which publication, apparently 19 people Kotaku. came... F Kotaku. Yeah, was it? Kotaku. Okay. Uh, 19 people came forward, I think that was the number, and said that they had no idea what the fuck was going on in regards to uh, the development of Anthem. It was mm -hmm. like people were being told stuff at the last minute about what engine they're going to be using, or... Uh, what is going to be implemented into the game? There was it was completely scatterbrained, like it was complete chaos in the office building. Um, EA making some again, you know, their wonderful demands, uh, pretty much sending people packing uh, from Bioware. I mean, people have been leaving that office for the last like ten years, like some of the the big wigs that have established Bioware. Um, it's just complete chaos, and Anthem turned out to be. A worse game for it. So, why is why are we just not surprised that EA is destroying another of their pro, of the, another, another another one of their companies that they bought? I want to. I actually do want to stop and note. Um, EA is definitely in large part at fault here, but I do think that we need to acknowledge that. This is a Bioware problem too, and of course, Bioware isn't. I don't uh, know. Clean I don't up know when this started happening, but the last two games, like the, the same pattern, occurred. We didn't hear anything about Dragon Age Inquisition, 
but apparently Dragon Age Inquisition was similar, and just the Bioware magic, as they described it in that article, saved that game. The, the basic point that came up was they came up with an idea like five years ago, and then nobody had any real direction or vision on it until somebody stepped in like two years with two years left on the development time. It was just like, this is what we got to do. Let's fucking do it. And they finally did it. It's it very much smacks to a corporate smacks of, excuse me, a corporate culture of nobody being willing to make a goddamn decision. And Everyone just being very it, lethargic, like huh? Worse. Like, it's not even lethargic. It's just that nobody nobody wants to decide anything. Nobody wanted to own... Complete lack of leadership of and direction is pretty much what it sounds like. Yeah, like, and there were people who are in charge, who are, like, actual leaders in the process, who just did not want to take a leadership role in this. Now, is it possible uh, that nobody wanting to take a leadership role in this is because nobody had faith in the project whatsoever and didn't want to have, you know their neck sticking out for it and possibly losing I mean, their job? by all indications, by all indications from everything I was reading about it, people loved the idea. It's just nobody wanted to, like, nobody, like, there was a lot of conflicting stuff. People would have conflicts back and forth. And nobody, nobody could come to a conclusion on it. It wasn't until they actually got, like, a definite project lead who was saying, fuck it, we're just gonna do this, that shit started happening. Like, Nobody, nobody could come to a conclusion, and it was very democratic in the process. And nobody could just step up and say, "Fuck it, this is what we're doing." So let's do it. So now here's here's a question. Outside of yeah, the 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 issues within Bioware itself and the disorganization that's going on, um, it just seems like with EA, you know, playing into this, it just seemed like they were just adding grease to the fire. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah, absolutely. It is. It, it just seems like at this point, it's like, why do so many companies? I mean, we've seen this with companies like Maxis and uh, uh, what's Peter Mal Bullfrog and so many other studios that EA absorbs, and they turn into complete chaos and crap. And why do these companies, including Bioware, decide? You know what? Let's get under their umbrella. They might. They we might see better days. Like, why do they keep doing this to themselves? Smaller companies do it because... Well, financial backing industry, is always a good thing. Right, the multi the, the gaming industry is a multi-billion dollar organization, a multi-billion dollar industry at this point. Mm -hmm. You have no guarantee of where your next project is coming from, where your next dollars are coming from. So, if you're a smaller company, you're going to do it because even if your company only lasts like another five to ten years, that's five to ten years that you have gainful employment and a steady paycheck, which you can't guarantee if you're an extremely small developer. Mm -hmm. The larger developers that they've acquired over the years mostly were acquired before EA got a reputation of like eating their young, you know? Um, at the time that BioWare was acquired, I want to say they had maybe eaten Origin... Oh, they ate Origin uh, long before, like Origin in the nineties. They had eaten Origin and Bullfrog. Mm -hmm. Um, and like that was that was really it. There, there wasn't this indication that they were going to absorb you as a company and murder you in your sleep. Maxis was still a reasonably successful company at that point, and. Like I want to say, Westwood was st Westwood was still doing stuff. Like Command and Conquer still existed at that point. So, like, there wasn't necessarily, you know, the the sort of examples that we've seen now of them having taken all of these development houses out back and having them shot. Most of the most of the companies that they've murdered at this point have been murdered while uh, Bioware has been under EA's banner, and. Like, Bioware absolutely... Like, a company now, if they got bought up that was Bioware size, you would have, like, reasonable a reasonable availability to ask that question, because what in the fuck are you thinking? But at that time, like, they could not have possibly known that they were going to be in this position where EA was going to be murdering every single fucking development house that they picked up and 
forcing them to use one of the shittiest goddamn game engines on the planet because they own it. Like, they, they could not have possibly known that this was going to happen. Like, I don't... I didn't like it at that point, but I could not possibly blame them for, you know, making that decision. I don't know what their financial situation was. But yeah, they could not possibly have known they were going to get fucked this hard. There's no way they there's no way they could have seen that coming because at that point we didn't have that kind of information. Like we didn't know then what we know now about how bad EA has become. Mhm. Now, one of the bigger one of the big problems that, you know, went into the development of Anthem, of course, was the use of the Frostbite engine. And Jan, you've mentioned it many times before what the Frostbite engine is good for, and it's a very 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 small list of games. Um Anthem Anthem's gameplay style is definitely not one of those games. They basically tried to take what they could from the Mass Effect <clears throat> property, I think is the word I'm looking for, and attempted to make a game that could both run in Frostbite and still have, you know, coherence in the Frostbite engine, and it just didn't work. Um... Yeah, I mean, the shooting is still good. I stand by the fact that the shooting still feels good. I I feel like, mechanically, the game is great. Mm -hmm. Everything else fell on its ass. And it's kind of a sad way of seeing it happen, too, because a lot of what the game touted and what they said the game was going to be doesn't exist. They said that this was supposed to be a story-driven game, and the story is so just segmented that it's like, <clears throat> you know, I, I made it about 40-ish percent into the main story of the game, and I'll tell you what, man, it's all over the place. And a lot of it is just so scraped together. Mm-hmm. I have to admit, there's really only one character I actually care about in the entirety of that game. That's it. One. And it's not even mine. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh... After this giant fumble brought to us by Bioware, how long of a road to recovery do you think they have in order in, or, in in regards to repairing their reputation? I mean, we've just had the last Dragon Age all game I... that uh, you know yeah. was okay. You had the last Mass Effect game, which was a piece of shit. Now you have Anthem, which is, according to Mark, shit. Um, how do you go about repairing your reputation? To the, the new gamers. Dragon Age better be goddamn phenomenal because if it's not, they're done, and that sucks to say because some of their earlier works were absolute masterpieces. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was excited about Bioware nice. back when they made games like you know, Neverwinter Nights. By the way, the enhanced edition is only six is only six dollars right now on Steam. I bought that, so that that shows the quality you of know, their work that I enjoy. Their older, their older library is relatively good. There's a couple of smur, you know, like, but man, uh, yeah. this next Dragon Age game better be their fucking crowning glory, or we can just kiss Bioware goodbye at this point. Because mm-hmm. all right, so there's just not a lot left of you know, there's not a lot of wind left in their sails. That's all there is to it. So I mean, I'll take it a step further, and I'll note that uh, Bioware is probably dead. So you think that even before the next Dragon Age even has a chance to emerge, you think they're no, going to be sure done? No, I'm sure they're going to get to point that out. They're, they're going to get the chance to develop that, but I don't I don't think it's going to be any good. Like, here's the thing. Um, all of the people who made Dragon Age Inquisition a success, except for, like, two or three of them, are gone. None of the people who were capable of producing the Bioware Magic, as it's called, are with the company anymore. Or very few of them are. The the people who are presently a part of the company just ha- have kind of been filtered in as needed. And they are not people who are capable of producing whatever magic Bioware needed to, mm-hmm. to get these games produced. <clears throat> Bioware had three studios. 
The one studio worked exclusively on Mass Effect Andromeda and then, you know, kept having resources taken away to work on Anthem and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now we are sort of in the awkward position where, okay, that studio has been scrapped. They're gone. They're, they're done with. Um, so now we have two. Bioware Studios, who don't particularly seem to get along or like one another. Okay. Here's the thing. What we learned from the Anthem article is a lot, but the, the main thing that I thought was really interesting is that demand for the people in the company who actually know how the Frostbite engine works is doled out relative to the importance of your project. So, when the Anthem team was attempting to develop stuff, they couldn't get any time because that group was sitting in with the FIFA team. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until it was realized that the game was fucked that they got any kind of time with the Frostbite team. I do not see EA doing anything to correct that behavior. I, I don't see them not continuing to use this piece of shit engine that nobody in their company seems to like except for the shooter developers. I don't see them making any kind of different or unique decisions beyond what they're already doing here. So what's probably going to happen is the exact same development cycle as Anthem or Mass Effect Andromeda or Dragon Age Inquisition, because it sounds like that went through the same fucking shit-ass development cycle. I, I think the same thing is going to happen, because it's happened three times already now, and unlike the first time, we are, we are going to see that what's going to happen is th this, this game is just not going to have any Bioware magic, it's just going to suck. All right. And a couple of people in that article stated they wish Dragon Age Inquisition had failed because hopefully the problem would have been addressed sooner. But I think that, you know, that the, after the third time, the problem's not going to get addressed. EA is just going to shut them down. Yep. All right, Mark. So uh, your estimated time and uh, date of death for Bioware. Um... They've only been working on the Dragon Age game about a year, and it seems like EA has been giving them a seven-year cycle on it. So I will give them until um, 2026. I'm going to give them until 2022, and at that point, EA is going to get fit up and take the project from them and move it on to one of their other newly acquired studios. Jan? Gosh. Um... I'm with Mark on this. I really think that they're going to let BioWare finish their game. Um, but at that point, they may end up just dispersing what's left into other studios or just letting the whole company just fall to shreds at that point. Okay. Well, this has been a very uplifting talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Sometimes video games are bad. <laughs> yeah. It is a sad, sad, sad little fact. The Quiet Man... <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody got fired over that one. Agony. I gotta be honest. Look, well, that was just a small company. I, that I, was just I, like I, five guys that didn't they know just they, they just existed to make that piece of shit. <laughs> Playing it was agony. Um, so now I have a I have a question mark. Mm -hmm. What is D Live? D Live is a live streaming service that is one of many that is attempting to bring competition to Twitch. Now, uh, we've seen lots of lots of live streaming services come and go. Uh, everybody, well, everybody here, at the very least, remembers Hitbox, uh, who mm -hmm. does not exist anymore. They have been merged into another company uh, that was also doing live streaming. Mixer. I cannot recall. Mixer. Uh, Mixer. I cannot recall what their, is their name Mixer now? Like that's, it's Mixer. Yeah, it's Mixer. Okay, so they're Mixer, which I've already seen people leave Twitch to go to and mm -hmm. then come back come to back. Twitch from. So, you know, that's not... It's just kind of funny, because I left Twitch for a while, and I went to Hitbox, and then Twitch made huge improvements in their uh, in their system, and I went back to them. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so I don't, I don't... And, in fact, you did the same... You did the same thing, too, for a while, if I recall, Mark. 
Correct. Yeah. I didn't even need them to make huge improvements. I just needed it to show when I was online. Mm -hmm. And it finally started showing when I was online. So I said, okay, I'll go back. But yeah, so outside of YouTube, Twitch is the place where you would go to stream. And it's, it's the number one streaming service. Like YouTube is definitely number two as far as that goes. So that's not stopping people from attempting to compete on some level or another. But when you are talking about having people stream media across the world, bandwidth is definitely an issue, service is definitely an issue, and a good amount of money is needed to get involved with that. DLive has raised a lot of venture capital for this sort of thing by offering the DLive service not just as a streaming platform, but as an overall content creation platform, their raison d'etre, their, their, their reason for existing is they quite literally call themselves a value-sharing content economy. So they're a timeshare? Ha! Oh! Oh. <laughs> no. No. Worse, <laughs> they're a cryptocurrency. Oh, of course. Yeah, so Lino as an organization is based around blockchain-based content sharing. So they have an app, DLive, on the Lino blockchain. Now, for those who have just recently heard of DLive, that is probably due to one reason. Your friend and mine... Um, Mr. Mr. Felix PewDiePie, I don't I don't know how to pronounce his last name, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, picked DLive as his exclusive live streaming platform just recently, and he is going to donate up to fifty thousand dollars to other creators. So, it would now be, this you, isn't you, you would be remiss to remember that it's not fifty thousand dollars; it's fifty thousand dollars through DLive. So yes. it's the DLive currency that he's giving you. Not yes. real money. It will be fifty thousand dollars in 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 Lino or mm -hmm. funny money, basically. Monopoly money. Um, Yay! Bison dollars. I'm gonna yeah. buy a hotel. Exactly. I feel like bison dollars are probably worth more than Lino actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, they threw money at Felix to get him on board as a partner for some period of time. We don't know how long he's going to be doing this, uh, where he will be presenting weekly live streams, which is meant to boost the visual nature of the DLive service. It's meant to get eyes onto the DLive product. Now, I could spend my time talking about what a murderous thing this is going to be for people attempting to become something on DLive. You know, th this is going to get eyes onto DLive, but only to the extent that it gets eyes onto PewDiePie. People are not really going to be migrating over to the DLive platform from Twitch. They'll just go to DLive to watch PewDiePie and then go back to Twitch for everything else. Uh, I could also note that any type of new content creators on that service are, are going to be completely screwed. Because anybody who is coming in is going to immediately be part of the PewDiePie army. So if you're somebody who, and you don't even have to dislike the guy, is somebody who just doesn't care about PewDiePie, you're just like, eh, whatever, I don't, I don't really think about him. Anybody coming into your chat is going to be expecting you to be a fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's immediately going to create situations where, like, this isn't just a case of, you can be a big fish in a small pond. Nobody can be bigger than PewDiePie on this platform. You don't even get to be the big fish in a small pond like you might on Mixer or something else. You're always going to be below Felix in the hierarchy. And if you're not a fan of Felix, a lot of the audience that you're going to be attracting is, is going to be toxic toward you. But I don't even necessarily want to talk about that because 
we've bagged on Felix enough mm -hmm. for a while. Like, there's just so much. There's only so much I can say about this guy. There's only so much that I can be asked to give a shit about him. I'm surprised you're being about... so uh, reserved, Mark. You love the guy clearly. Oh yeah, absolutely. He's he's my fucking favorite. <laughs> yeah, but what I wanna what I wanna talk about here is more what D Live and Lino actually are, because this like Mr. Pure Instinct Spencer, a uh, friend of the friend of the show, a uh, friend of mine personally, made a D Live account a few months ago. And it was just like, okay, whatever. N nobody really thought anything about it. Mm -hmm. We didn't. We didn't really look at it. Like he made it once, and then we just kind of forgot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So when this came out, like he was kind of sort of talking, <laughs> been talking about maybe making the move over. So when I saw the PewDiePie article on it, I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Because I started reading the the Variety article that I saw about it. And I started reading, and as soon as I saw the sentence, DLive is built on top of the Lino Network blockchain-based currency system, my, my brain fucking took a shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I, I have some decided disagreements with some of my friends on the value of blockchain as a thing right mm -hmm. um my 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 friend god of zig has value in the idea of the blockchain but not necessarily in like what we're doing right now mm -hmm. i think blockchain may eventually be something of value but not at this point So, Mark, tell me exactly, uh, live errors, nice, um, what is exactly a blockchain? Oh, boy, here we go. Here we go. So, um, do you know what Bitcoin is? Yes, sir, I do. Good, that actually resolves uh, a, a lot, lot of my difficulties. Uh, yeah. So, let's, let's pretend for a moment that you don't. Uh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. It's essentially data that has a degree of value ascribed to it for some reason. Cryptocurrency is something that was invented as like a theoretical concept, like a, a way in which we could create a sort of decentralized currency that wasn't owned by the government utilizing computer technology and things of that nature. It's, it's always just kind of sort of been meant as a thought experiment like like uh, like science you know Th there was never there was never really necessarily an idea of turning it into a use case back when uh, Satoshi Kojima which is almost certainly a pen name uh, and his folks associated with uh, the Bitcoin conversation started like implementing it it was always kind of sort of meant to be just like an experiment uh, a test of how this stuff worked and it immediately appealed to a couple of different groups of people. So, here's the thing about most forms of, well, generally, from what I've seen, all forms of cryptocurrency. They can be generated in one of two ways. The first way is that a content platform owns all of the currency. They just have it. They mint however much of it they're going to mint, and then they distribute it periodically. This is what it sounds like DLive is doing. The second method is that you can mine for this currency, which is what Bitcoin does. Mining, in both cases, they use something called the blockchain, which is the simplest way that I can describe it is a permanent transaction ledger. It exists as a way of being able to verify every single thing that has ever been done with any of the coins that exist in this particular cryptocurrency. When you mine the blockchain, when you do work on the blockchain in Bitcoin, if you complete 
a transaction before somebody else does, you get a Bitcoin as a result of this. It's a reward for having completed this. The longer that Bitcoin exists, the harder that it is to mine the transaction, the harder that it is to mine the transaction, um, the, the, the more that Bitcoins become worth because we're eventually getting to a point where there's a finite endpoint of being able to get those coins. Bitcoin exploded in popularity because, as it turned out, <laughs> if you had shitloads of money and tech available, it was really easy to mine Bitcoins. And the actual existence of Bitcoin appealed to three different groups of people. Libertarian types who really, really like the idea of currency that is not backed by the government. Because, you know, libertarians are not necessarily government lovers, such as it is. No, you don't um, say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 they're not big fans of the government. So the idea of a decentralized currency that has nothing to do with the government is for them is like, that's great. I fucking love it. Let's go. Uh, the second group is speculators. People who just want to make money off of whatever exists. Uh, the easier it is to make, the better. They saw, you know, Ooh. investing in Bitcoin as, hey... This is a way that I can buy low and sell high. Mm -hmm. uh, the third group is criminals, because mm -hmm. having a currency that is decentralized and like not anonymous, but has a degree of anonymity attached to it, is instantly going to be appealing to somebody who wants to buy drugs on the internet for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> I don't fucking know why, you know, it's just a thing that happened. Needless to say, um, most of your cryptocurrencies that exist at this point have generally just been created by people who want to dick around and test the stuff. And then the cryptocurrencies always end up getting co-opted by people who want to financially invest in this in some form or fashion and turn it into a security. So that was that was like the first wave of people creating cryptocurrencies. They would create the currency as a thought experiment, as a tech experiment, and then they would look on fucking mouth agape as people like turned this shit into an actual financial shit show. Like the people who made the currency Ethereum that exists right now still just poke their heads in every now and again to just stare and go, "What in the fuck are you people doing?" Like they don't they don't get why this stuff is worth like a thousand dollars a coin or whatever the current market value is for it it's, it's ridiculous mm -hmm. we are currently in the, the 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 second wave of this sort of stuff where companies are basically looking at coin offerings as a method of attempting to actually make money this is like it's sort of like in the position where the dot com boom where you had initial public offerings where they would sell whatever amount of stock they had as an as an initial public offering people would come in and buy shitloads of whatever from that um and then that would kind of be the end of it and then like you know like the dot com company would either be bought out or would crap out or whatever and you would cash in once they went public most companies these days are doing an ICO, initial coin offering, which is great because you're essentially selling value in your company, but unlike with stocks, these people don't fucking own anything. They can't tell you what to do. They can't do anything about what you ultimately do. It's all of the financial benefit of initial public offerings with none of the people actually owning stock in your company part of it. It's at least a little bit concerning from a legality perspective, but that's not what we're here for. Point is, DLive is kind of sort of in that position. The Lino group basically was like, hey, we want to fund the ability to share content, to, to value share content. And they did a public offering, uh, uh, a, an ICO, and made like some ridiculous amount of money. I want to say it was like $200 million or something like that. And they decided, we're going to make DLive. We're going to make a, a, a competing service to Twitch. 
So, are are you are you with me so far on this? Yeah, like, absolutely. Okay, just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to make sure that like I got I wasn't distracted. Getting... I thought my cat. I thought my cat was getting underneath and trying to bite my cables. No, I just I <laughs> wanted to make sure that I wasn't being ridiculously boring. Nope. And all of no, this, no, no. I'm listening. It's it's. I definitely am with you so far. Okay. Oh, it was behind the, me. Now, oh, okay. most streaming platforms are based off of the <clears throat> idea that they would like it very much if you kept contributions to your favorite streamers in the house. Mm hmm. Because back in the day, when Twitch and then before that, Justin TV. And other companies was, like Ustream. And, or or the actual live stream company itself, yeah. Yeah, live stream. When they would do stuff, it would just they would just let you post like a donation link on your page, and mm -hmm. the only way that they were making money was off of advertisements, which, as we have since learned, is not the most economical way of doing business. They would like it very much if you kept your donations in house. So in Twitch's case, they they let you donate via bits. I don't know what YouTube does because I've never bothered to look into it for streaming, but I imagine that they have a similar thing mm -hmm. in place. Either way, how it works is you donate money to the streamer either directly or through bits or whatever, and the streamer gets a percentage of that money. Now, the streamer can just have like a donation link at the bottom where you donate to them via PayPal or whatever. But Twitch and whatnot attempts to keep people engaged by, you know, having the bits do neat little cheers and having stuff integrated into streaming platforms and services. You can completely avoid it, but you don't have to. But if you buy bits, somebody, I think, like, the streamer gets, like, 50%. If you subscribe to the channel, the streamer gets 50%, something like that. And mm -hmm. Twitch takes 50%. percent mm hmm So, DLive's promise is that if you buy Lino to give to a streamer, the streamer gets... What's the exact number? It was... 90.1%. Of the donations. That seems arbitrary. No, there's a reason for that, actually. Yeah, okay. I figure there's that, a catch somewhere. No, there's not a catch, and that's the problem. See, th there is a reason why that number exists, and it is dumber than whatever you are thinking right now. Oh, good. Please inform me. Yes. So, that is to why 90.1% is the number, because I'm waiting for this one. It's going to be great. Yeah, so... Lino, the, the Lino organization has essentially created this thing where, like, they just have a supply of Lino. They're not mining it. It's the currency has just been made. I don't know how it was made because, despite the fact that they are a crypto organization, that they that they have a cryptocurrency in place, there is an astonishingly limited amount of information on their cryptocurrency. Maybe they're one of those companies that somehow hacks into other people's computers and uses their, you know, GPUs for the mining. Well, they don't have to. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can... If you... I don't... I'll try and make this simple. I, I, I promise I will do with it what I can. So, um, Ethereum is the second most notable of the cryptocurrencies that exist at this moment in time. You probably haven't heard of it unless you are at least a little bit interested in, in, in cryptocurrency. Because Bitcoin is the one everybody talks about. Here's the thing. Ethereum has a specific blockchain interface that they work off of called ERC-20. You don't have to mine if you're using that compatibility. You mm -hmm. can just create what's called a smart contract which is a whole other separate can of things. I'm not going to get into oh, it. I'm boy. just going to say, imagine that smart contracts are like real-world contracts, but handled by computers. And imagine what a fucking nightmare that would be. <laughs> That's a smart oh, contract, okay? Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> you create it. a smart contract that manages a pile of whatever fucking coin you've made. Mm -hmm. You sell some of it, and then you keep the rest. So, 
whatever the economic existence is of this, like you have, <coughs> let's say you have a thousand coins that exist. Mm -hmm. You just make those thousand coins. You don't have to mine for them. You don't have to do anything. Like they, they just exist. You've just minted this money for yourself. Okay. It's like Bitcoin, but you own it. Um, hmm. Mostly okay. companies just use this for initial coin offerings, and that's by all indications what the Lino Group is doing. Like they're just using this to be an in-house currency. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they intend for it to have a value that can be traded on cryptocurrency exchanges, but I would expect probably yes. I think that's that's what they want to do here. I think that's what they're going for. Mm -hmm. So here's here's the thing. Um. The reason why it's concerning... Now, I'll, I'll get back to this, but just keep in mind, this is concerning to me that we don't know anything about this cryptocurrency. Like, we have no information. They've mm -hmm. released multiple white papers. None of the white papers they've released are on what the fuck their currency does or how it works. Is it possible that maybe somewhere in the end this is actually just a giant elaborate scheme Scheme or scam? Oh no, this hey. isn't possible. It's it's it's. I would be astonished if it's not. Okay, so it's definitely That's most likely a scam, and they managed to get type of a fucking grift. And they got one of the biggest names on the internet to be the flagship bearer. Oh, he doesn't fucking know. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, this, this is, isn't. I, let's I be think honest. He probably he probably doesn't <laughs> care. Uh, yeah. Of, the, the end game in this is not making DLive be something that could be good and possibly even be like... No, 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 no. This is basically... DLive is basically the Epic Game Store to Twitch as, as like, Epic is to... Steam. To fuck it, Steam. Like, this is... It's a fucking scam. People are going to lose money. And all it does is benefit him. Like it, it only benefits Felix. Period. Right. I mean, I think that I think that Epic definitely thinks that their Epic Game Store is going to be something that they definitely wanted to be something. I don't know how anybody else involved feels about it, but I think Epic actually wants to, you know, make a store that sells things and is a is, is a you know a competitor to Steam. Because at least their business practices, dumb as they are, indicate that they have an idea of how to do business. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lino is not doing that. No. So here's the thing. Um, every year, they're basically saying that they're going to mint Lino that is produced with every block in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Now, blocks are produced via content being produced on the DLive network or on other apps. Right now, it's just DLive. I'm not 100% sure how streaming for 10 hours produces blocks. I'm assuming that they're not hijacking everyone's browsers to mine currency, and I'm thinking that this is just something that they're doing internally, but it's a very stupid way of tracking your blockchain, of, like, of tying it into how much streaming is done in a year. That just seems kind of silly, but whatever pretty sure it's the other part i don't i don't even think they're mining i think they just have all of the actual coin supply mm -hmm. like i don't think they need to mine so really? it's just very confusing uh, yeah you can just make your own coins now ah, like that's fair, that's fair. what the, the the ethereum chain does it just lets you make your own coins but like again so it's, how do you profit is the question how does so so the, that that's the question like, that i'm actually how, getting to right thanks like so so how how does the streamer get paid Good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an well, even thanks for question. joining us on GV and Lab. No, I'm uh, good night, everybody. There's an even bigger question that I actually have here. Like the short answer is, they just go to the Lino Corporation and ask for their money. But there's a bigger question that's actually being involved that we're that I, I swear I'm going to get to in like two minutes. Okay, so. Every year they generate this money. 65% of the Lino goes to infrastructure providers, like the companies that are keeping their shit afloat, more or less. 10% goes to the app developers. 10% goes to validators, which would be the people who do the work of validating their blockchain to make sure that like sure. all the transactions sure. are correct. 
Ten percent goes to content creators, Felix and his ilk, and the five percent goes to viewers because there's like a little button. Like when you do stuff in the chats, you can be paid out a lino for you know talking in chats and like you know spamming emojis and shit like that. Annually, they will not release more than six point five percent of the lino that exists, which okay. basically means that like. In about 18 years, all of the lino that will ever exist will ever exist in this app. So they don't, they don't have an existence plan beyond 18 years. Ugh. Because after that point, they will have distributed all the lino that will ever exist. So they're expecting the lino to basically just stay on the page. And that they expect that eventually they'll get to a point let's say they create a merch store just as a baseline mm -hmm. you earn lino and then you're able to then purchase goods from the lino store with the lino that you've created on DLive. basically that's that's what is going to end up having to happen here because there's you have to circulate the money and if you oh, can't no. circulate the money out of there if the lino has already been sold out like so so basically if 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 i got let's say Let's just say for the sake of argument that 10 lino is $100. I pulled that 10 lino out of circulation. That 10 lino no longer exists. Yep. What then? They are, you got the same 10 lino just floating around for the rest of the 18 years at that point because everyone's bought out? They are <laughs> likely making the assumption that people will consistently be spending lino back into the production in some form or fashion so that like it'll just constantly be circulating but i also imagine that they probably think in 18 years it won't fucking matter anyway and they'll all be <laughs> gone but yeah like that's their business model they don't have a they don't have a plan for generating any more money after 18 years like whatever money exists at that point will have to come from money that has been brought in uh from existence mm -hmm. so here's how the, the the process works you put whatever amount of money into the service mm -hmm. and they will give you lino for it the mm -hmm. last time that i checked the value of lino like one lino was like 0 0.017 cents <laughs> or like 1.7 cents for every lino because you know it's a, it's a fucking cryptocurrency at this point it, it has no value beyond what has been ascribed to it and what was the value okay. of Bitcoin again? A thousand dollars? But Bitcoin, I think, is at like three thousand dollars right now. Mm -hmm. It's been forever since I've checked. Um, but it's well, yeah. Like Bitcoin is also traded. Uh, a lot of these currencies are not necessarily four thousand nine hundred ninety-three dollars and fifty-five cents. Yep. Yep. 5, I just bucks. looked it up. Yep. But yeah. So here's here's how it works. You donate one lino. Like you donate an amount of lino to a streamer. Any lino you donate, 90.1% of all donations and paid subscriptions made using lino will be paid algorithmically to the content creator. The remaining 9.9% .9 is held in reserve by the blockchain protocol and it is distributed to all lino stakeholders as voting rewards for their contribution to blockchain governance. Apps utilizing the Lino blockchain protocol should not take cuts from donations, paid subscriptions, and any other transactions between content creators and viewers. In other words, anytime you make a donation, whoever you've donated to gets 90%. And about 10% is put aside to be put into a pool to people who are considered Lino stakeholders. Now you might be asking, what the fuck is a Lino stakeholder? So, when you are given your lino bucks for having done stuff on the service... Lino bucks. <laughs> yeah, your, your funny money. They ask you to lock in uh, a set amount of it to, like, to be partnered, basically. I, I believe the number right now is 2,000 lino, which, okay. you know, isn't very much right now. Um... Yeah, so there are Lino points uh, that have been secured through your Lino account, and you earn rewards for your contributions based on the consumption for all content of the previous day. So essentially, you are being asked to lock in uh, a certain amount of money in order to be considered partnered. 
Okay. Now, you can unlock your points whenever you want, obviously, but if you have points locked, you get to be considered a partner on the service, which means that, among other things, you can upload video content, you would get additional recognition on the service, um, you would get, you know, Lino distributed to you every day just for being a partner on the platform and so on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what okay. You're, what you're what you're telling me is, and and I'm probably dating myself on this, but basically it's Amway. No, see, with Amway you actually get products. Ah, fair. Amway is a legal Ponzi scheme. <laughs> see, <laughs> how are we sure this isn't? How are we sure this isn't? Here's the thing. If you go back and you listen to that breakdown where 90% of a donation that you give to a streamer is given mm -hmm. to the streamer directly and 10% mm -hmm. is put into a pool that goes to all the people who have locked Lino coins, what's missing from that list? Lino? Yeah. The actual fucking company isn't making any goddamn money off of it. <laughs> so, okay. Maybe they're making money from advertisements, right? No. DLive doesn't run advertisements, mm -hmm. nor do they ever plan to. Mm -hmm. And the Lino organization has stated they will never take a cut. So, they're not taking a cut from any of the donations that are being made. They're not running advertisements. How is this funded? They... Exactly. And How is any of this funded? Who, who, who And I want to I want to draw you to a quote. This? I want to draw you to the quote that made me start looking into all of this from Variety. Uh, they were talking to um, one of the developers for this. Uh, like, there's there's like a bunch of different people uh, associated with it, but there is like the person that they were talking to. His name is something way. I can't remember his first name, unfortunately, just because mm. searching through um, all of this different stuff is, is very difficult. Um, so, basically, they were founded back in 2017, and they raised $20 million in funding uh, led by a Beijing-based capital venture firm named ZenFund, mm -hmm. with participation from FBG Capital, DFund, and in blockchain. Okay. 20, they, have, they have $20 million in capital. Okay. So, okay. Variety asked Wei, what is Lino's ultimate business model? And Wei said, quote, we are growing fast. Monetizing is not in our short-term plans. Our sole focus is growth. How, if you are not, you need if, money in order growth? to expand and grow. How That's the growth? most terrifying goddamn thing that if, if, you, if you have invested in a company what? and, like, their statement is we don't have a plan for how to make money, that you fucked up. Wow! Now, wow. so <sighs> now people people on cryptocurrency forums have been discussing, you know, uh, is this legit? And like the question that came up was, where does the money come from? There was a D Live mod in the chat, and he essentially said from investors. So my question was, where do these investors get their ROI? New investors, he said. They also claim that no crypto is being mined while watching the stream, which sounds like a Ponzi scheme. Which, yes, if investors are getting their money from new investors who are coming in, that's a Ponzi scheme. That's literally what that is. So the people who are defending this are saying, well, it's not a scam because they raised $20 million in early 2018 from investors in the industry. Which, yes, they did. That doesn't mean it's not a scam. It just means that a bunch of investors dumped money into it. Uh, the rewards they use, that they pay to users are minimal and could easily be covered by future ads, except that they've stated that they do not do advertising and have no intention of ever doing advertising. Like, mm. they've stated they do not want to put advertisement on the platform. Additionally, even if they were running advertising, mm -hmm. the amount of, like, Twitch ran advertising, and that was not enough to make them fungible as an organization. 
Like, you can't just run ads. The, the, the days of ads being worth anything are fucking over with. They've been over with for years. L decade. Like, all, like, over a decade at this point. Advertising money in and of itself is just not enough to run a company like this. Um, so, like, they're basically saying, yeah, like, somebody else corrected this guy and said, um, like, they're an Atlas platform and there's no plans to generate revenue using it. Yes. They don't take a cut. The 9.9 .9 taken from every donation is distributed as daily rewards to Lino wallets. Yes. And it's not a mineable currency. DLive originally wanted to run the whole service peer to peer, but currently they're hosting it off of AWS, which is Amazon oh. Web Services, which is. Right, 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 right. That's, that's their fucking platform. That's wow. where a bunch of their money is going. Mm -hmm. So he says. Lino was very smart about how they created their service. To become a partner, you are required to lock 2,000 Lino from your wallet, which introduces users to the concept of locking points. Anyone that has locked points will receive a portion of the 10% of Lino taken from every donation. The amount that these users receive is based on the total number of locked Lino and the total amount of Lino put into the rewards pool from each donation. This is an inflation concept similar to what Steam, S-T-E-E-M, has. The reward payout is based on how much Lino is locked and how many donations are being made. They want to get users to continually keep locking their Lino with the temptation that they will be getting a larger cut, when the truth is that the users will have to keep up with inflation over time <coughs> by locking more and more Lino for the same general payout. In this way, they trap users into locking all of their profits from donations to keep up with inflation, and this reduces the overall amount of Lino they need to pay out until much further down the road once they have enough users that people purchasing new Lino can cover the costs of payouts. Mm -hmm. So basically, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to encourage n people to never take the money out until they are at a point where so many people are on the platform that new purchases can justify it. Hmm. So but it's not just a no Ponzi scheme, money. it's a pyramid scheme as well. well. Yeah, but the thing is is that like they're 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 basically trying to get you to lock in all of this money. Mm -hmm. But they're not actually making any money off of this. Like the most they could be making money from is interest accrued from them having the actual physical real world money in some kind of an interest bearing account somewhere it is basically it's it's basically a ponzi scheme where they're you're putting all of this money into this service mm -hmm. and then it's just sitting there and swimming around but they're not taking any of it they're just living off of the venture capital that they have mm -hmm. so what happens when the venture capital runs out we don't fucking know yeah, and they don't have any plans uh, for the short term right. or long term, apparently. Right. They're the, they're basing this whole thing around the idea of encouraging users to lock down their accounts, to lock an amount of uh, Lino in their accounts so that they can get Lino rewards on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's the thing. Streamers are not going to do that mm -mm. because they need to fucking eat. They're in it for... The other thing I think is really is that they're playing off of the idea that they're in it for a livelihood. They're in it to make this their job, and they're going in on it basically saying, I'm riding in on Felix Coattails, that I can do what he does and have fun doing it and make money and be on the camera and play video games for a living. And that dream is going to get shattered real fucking quick. Yeah. When they it's... realize they can't do that with this platform. Yeah, it's, it, this is this is if anything going to make it harder for them to keep up with the model that they're going with because they they had to pay part of their venture capital out to Felix mm -hmm. to get him on board, which is you know money that's just gone. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, okay, you're going to have all these people who are going to be investing. People who move over there are presumably people who are used to seeing some degree of payout from Twitch. If you've got people who are brand new who are starting up there, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these people are going to look at this as, you know, I want to get paid. The idea of locking down Lino so you can get more and more of a payout is, like, great, I guess. It's like gambling. Yeah, but, well, it's not even like gambling. It's because you're, you're guaranteed to keep the money that you've locked. Like, it's not going to go away. You're just trying to increase the potential payout you can get. It, it, it's mm -hmm. a safe-ish form of gambling. 
but the thing is is that we like you don't know if you're ever going to be able to pull your money out mm -hmm. and that's how ponzi schemes work you dump in money and you dump in money and they promise you that your money is going to grow and they promise you that your money is going to grow and they tell you how much your money has grown but if you ever come in and try to take all of that money out they're fucking dead and that's the thing is that they probably have some money in reserve because again they raise like 20 million dollars in venture capital but they need money to keep the lights on and they don't seem to have a way of actually generating that and that's the part that's concerning to me and the other thing going back to their cryptocurrency here before i said we don't know anything about it and it, it's kind of important to note that because if their cryptocurrency actually wants to, like if they want to try and make this so that lino is some type of a cryptocurrency that can be traded in exchanges and whatnot mm -hmm. like outside of their platform we don't know anything about what their currency can actually do <clears throat> and that's kind of important because all the currencies that exist right now are slow as fucking shit. They they take forever to perform any type of transactions, and if you attempt to do transactions on their particular block, it can take minutes to hours. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to buy Lino or trying to cash out Lino, we don't know how quickly Lino transactions can be processed. So it if that if this service gets big enough oh god you could try to buy currency for somebody like for you know a donation and not see it until the stream is over mm -hmm. not see it until the next fucking day there's there's not going to be any kind of immediacy on that because that's just not how that service works and with with a, a with a fucking content creator like PewDiePie that's going to happen we don't know anything about the technology behind this. They haven't released any white papers indicating what the technology is behind this. The only thing I can compare I can bleh, compare it to is something like Ethereum. So when you're talking about block analysis, Ethereum has a block time of around 14 to 16 seconds. For comparison, Bitcoin, Bitcoin takes about 10 minutes. So that's, that's a big improvement over Bitcoin. Sure. Uh, how do blocks make it across the network in that time, you might ask? Most of the time, they don't. So there are there are 7% seven of, seven of the time, uh, you will frequently have valid blocks that are just orphaned. And then... Oh, shit. Yeah, so they, they attempt to confirm transactions by having people who are doing mining pick up those unconfirmed transactions and verify them. We're not doing mining with this, so we don't know how that necessarily is going to work or what it their block exists. processing is. Yeah. So maybe their block processing is slow as fuck, like bitcoins. Maybe it's fast, but it drops stuff, and there's no like incentive for any of that sort of analysis. Either way, it's, it's confusing. Ugh, but the yeah. bigger issue is that <laughs> Ethereum has a current maximum transaction load of 14 per second bitcoins is seven oh. per second yes oh wow do you know how many transactions visa does per second <laughs> a lot 1700 and they can handle more oh absolutely yeah if you wanted to replicate Visa's transaction speed on Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you would basically need enough electricity to do it uh, to power, I believe the the example that was given was the entirety of Greenland. I'm out. Yeah. So, um... Nope, I'm out. Fuck it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there, you just uh, dashed all her dreams right there. She was going to retire on Bitcoin. Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, no, no. no. Do I deal like just like my initial like this is an aside and we'll get back to finishing it out, but the 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 30 seconds 30 seconds I spent looking at D live 
I'm like, this basically looks like Mixer. It's trying to be Twitch, but it looks like Mixer. Okay, that's not bad. It's got visibility. It's got a scoreboard. Big fat, hey, look who the number one is, PewDiePie. Here's all the other people with just as many viewers. Dig, 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 like top ten on the site. Okay, sure. Sure. Okay. Let's highlight people. That's fine. Um, go into a stream. First thing I see in chat, do you really follow PewDiePie? Oh yeah, I totally follow Papa Pew. Sure, let me pull it up on my phone. I'm out. Nope. Nope. This is honestly to be true. Just, just hearing everything that Mark says, D Live, I don't think will make it after a couple of years. Just, just... Well, yeah, I mean, it's just like the thing to keep in mind is okay. Ethereum is is at 14 transactions. Let's say by some act of God. Mm -hmm. These guys have figured out how to double that transaction time. You can handle 28, 30 transactions per second. Okay. Um, how many people do you think will be... Like, my, my, my friend Fengrush streams and gets about 4,000 people on mm -hmm. average. How many people do you think will be in a stream for PewDiePie? Probably double that. Like, eight, maybe 10,000, let's say? Maybe. Okay, what if all of them try to buy Lino at the same time? Ooh. Yeah. If you can handle 30 transactions per second, let's say there's 30,000 people in that Ooh. chat at some point. All of them try to buy Lino at the same time. That's 1,000 seconds it will take to process this. Which, you know, is like, like 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But if they keep trying to do it, you're going to start seeing, and that's like just for PewDiePie, you're going to see more and more people going in, trying to make purchases for other streamers, things like that. Mm -hmm. If you attempt to do a purchase of Lino, and it takes you like half an hour, and again, this is any transaction you make, so that's not just buying Lino. That's donating Lino to the streamer is also clogging up that transaction space. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm You know, that's oh, cashing your lino out is clogging up that transaction space. Yeah. And that's the maximum, which is 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 frequently it, it doesn't it can't even manage that. Alright. Well it sounded too good to be true, although there was nothing amazing about it to begin with, other than a big name being slapped around, uh yeah, it's, it's a competing stream platform that, that sounds like it's, you know, oh, we have enough money to get PewDiePie, so we're going to try and go at it with Twitch. Yeah, they're using the blockchain model, which a decade in, nobody's found a good use mm -hmm. for blockchain. Sorry. Mm -hmm. There's no problem that can be solved. With so, I... Yeah, the, I'm the, only the giving this a couple model years. Is, the cryptocurrency model is going to make it way slower and more cumbersome to perform activities than it would otherwise. They have no model in place for turning a profit. Mm -mm. At a best case, they are a Ponzi scheme where they're hoping that you will store any money that you get in hopes of continuing to earn more and more of their funny money without ever cashing in, that you will just keep your funny money in there and send it around, and they're hoping that streamers will do the same. It's, mm -hmm. it's very much a thing where they just want it to exist internally forever and i i would not be surprised if they try to get it tradable within six months to a year after pewdiepie going on the service if if not sooner if they do then that's ultimately their end goal get lino some type of value cash the fuck out and leave hmm. i i do not think that this is like, I'm not going to say that I think that they're definitely shysters, but this is some shady <laughs> fucking shit. Yeah, I would agree. And that's, I that's, would not be surprised if they are fucking uh, shysters. thing right there. But, um, all right, so... There we go. Thank you very much, Mark, for educating me. I appreciate that. I'm Mark's glad I can help. Okay. Um, oh, end of the show. I want to thank everybody for sticking around, and, uh... Let's, uh... Let's, let's uh talk about what we got going on right now mark you have something exciting you're doing right um assuming that i can get 
uh, the final pieces of input that I need. Uh, hopefully, I will be having a video go live tomorrow cool. on my channel. Um, Mark B. Writing over on YouTube. Yay! I don't have enough subscribers that I could actually give it a custom URL, unfortunately. So you'll just have to go to YouTube and search for Mark B. Writing, or just, you know, go to my, twi my Twitter channel, uh, because I will be posting a link to it on my Twitter as soon as it's ready to go live. All right. Uh, and you're still streaming Fridays and Saturdays, correct? Yep. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until I get tired. Every Friday, I stream for Let's Play Friday. Some part of Super Robot Wars V until that's complete. And then on Saturdays, we do variety stuff with the occasional board games thrown in. And what is this Saturday? Is it board game night? No, it's a video games again still. I don't know when the next board game night is, actually. I have to figure that out. I think it's next week. Okay. But I'm not 100% sure. Maybe the week after. All right. And Jan, what do you got going on? Um, pretty much the same stuff. Again, it a lot of stuff is up in the air as far as personal stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, as, as it stands right now, things are pretty much right where they were. And nothing's really changed at this point. I'm still... Doing what I do on Twitter and Instagram, and I stream when I can, and we go from there. Okay. Uh, well, next one, next Tuesday is another GVN Live Plays. Mark, what are we playing? I don't fucking know. Oh, I thought we I thought we agreed on it. Did we? Yeah, I thought we were gonna play Melty Blood. Oh, are we? Okay. I mean, oh, if we could, if we're gonna make up our minds and find something else. No, that's that's fine. I just I legitimately did not remember that we had agreed on that. We tested I mean, it. We tested to make it. Make sure that it had a lobby, which it does. Um, which hey Jan, do you have Milty Blood again? Act actress, the only one that's on Steam. Actress oh. again, current code. Yeah, current code. No, I don't have that one. I have Eunice, but that's all I've got, and I don't have Milty Blood right now. I think it's on sale. Oh well, then tentatively, right now it's uh, Milty Blood, but uh, we might change that as time goes um seems good yep yeah. right now my streaming is a little sporadic i have not streamed the last monday or wednesday for the past couple of weeks now monster hunter has been on hold for a bit we might return me and reggie might return on monday next week not sure what's going on with my three vets and a noob it seems like everybody that's in the group does not seem to want to agree on playing something so i just get frustrated and be like f it for the night uh so We'll figure out what we're doing next week. Uh, I did recently release a video last week, which is a new game adaptation review. I did, uh, me and Reggie covered uh, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Um, I'm pretty proud of this video. I think uh, we did a pretty good job. And uh, next video we're working on, uh, I kind of don't want to spoil it, although I do think some people might <laughs> enjoy it quite a bit. So, uh Soon, TM. Soon. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, with that being said, I want to say uh, thank you from everyone here on GVN Live for tuning in tonight, and have yourself a wonderful night. <laughs>